I'd like to start by thanking uh, the conference organizers. I was really excited to be invited to Belarus for this conference. Um, one of my co-authors on this paper was here recently, and he told me how much uh, how great a time he had, and so far so good for me as well. So thank you again for everybody who invited me. This is Women's Liberation as a Financial Innovation. It's joint with Moshe Khazan, one of my colleagues, and Husni Zwabi at the New Economic School in Moscow. So as economists, we tend to think that property rights are the most important um, necessary con condition for efficiency in financial markets and economic growth. But <coughs> Hobbitsure, which is a doctrine part of British common law, greatly do, do I need to speak? So as economists, we tend to think that property rights are the most important aspect of financial markets and economic growth in general. Coverture, which was a part of British common law, so think the law in England, Canada, Australia, and America, greatly limited the legal and economic status of married women. So undoing coverture was the single greatest expansion of property rights in American or British history. This is a fact that was not lost on people at the time. So during the debate as to whether or not to give women property rights in England in 1870, MP Russell Gurney said, it is now proposed that for the first time in our history, the property of one half of the married people of this country should receive the protection of the law. Up to this time, the property of a wife had no protection of the law. So that's a quote from the debate during, in the British House of Commons. So the, the basic question we're asking in this paper is, how do property rights affect financial markets and growth? And what we're going to do is exploit the fact that in America, women were granted property rights state by state. So we have nice cross-state variation to exploit. And when possible, we will do a border analysis. So thinking there's no real difference between Pennsylvania and Ohio at that border, it's sort of arbitrary. Let's compare people on either side. So first, I have to tell you a little bit about the property rights um, that were given to women. So once upon a time, 150, 160 years ago, if I got married in America, all my wife's pers personal or movable assets became mine forever. So a movable asset is literally anything that you can move. It's money, it's jewelry, it's livestock. It just becomes mine. I can bequeath it to somebody else when I die. I can take her jewelry, I can sell it and buy myself um, shoes, whatever I want, simply mine. As opposed to movable assets, immovable assets, real estate, became under my control, but in, under my wife's name. So my wife has a plot of land. I can grow whatever crops I want and take them. She has an apartment, I can rent it out and take the income, but I can't sell it without her permission. And whenever the uh, marriage ends for whatever reason, usually due, due to death at this time, divorce was quite, quite rare, the real estate reverted back to my wife or her descendants. Earnings laws at the same time said that if my wife worked in the labor market, then her income went to me. So this was a big deal in England where wi married women worked at about 25%. In America, this is much less of a big deal. So afterwards, talk to me about a continuation of this project where we're looking at England. Um, so looking at these laws, you immediately see that there's a pretty strong disincentive for a single woman before she gets married to put money into a bank. She doesn't want movable assets. Or if I'm a father of a daughter, I also don't want to put money in a bank for her. I want to buy her an apartment. I want to buy her land so that she has something that my son-in-law can't take away from her. So... There's a strong disincentive to invest in movable assets. So as a working example for throughout this discussion, whenever I'm thinking movable, I'm thinking bank deposits. Okay? So this leads to an underinvestment in movable assets or bank deposits. Now think this is the time of the second industrial revolution in England and America. We need people putting money into banks so the banks can lend out to factories, to the canals, to the railroads. So um, lack of property rights led to inefficiencies through the financial markets. So when we grant women property rights, what we expect to see under this hypothesis, under the story I just told you, is that on an individual household level, we expect to see a portfolio reallocation from real estate towards movables, towards bank deposits. On the aggregate, we expect to see more bank deposits lower interest rates, and more bank loans. So we expect to see a supply shock in financial markets. And this supply shock we would expect to see cause more industrialization. So we would expect to see non-agricultural employment or manufacturing employment go up. And we would also expect to, to see this bias towards more capital-intensive industries. So industries that really need finance 
are the ones that are most helped by this financial market supply shock. So these four hypotheses are exactly what I'm going to show you in the US data, exploiting the fact that there was uh, cross-state variation in the timing of these rights. Um, so just two words about the literature. We're sort of related to this literature on property rights, so what were the causes, why did men give women property rights, and what were the effects. Um, there's also this literature about property rights and growth, and where we fit in is just saying, hey, this literature about property rights and growth, you missed the biggest expansion of property rights in American history, giving them to women. So a little bit about that. Um, so this is a map of the United States, and every state it has in it the date that women were granted property rights. So the first state was Massachusetts in 1846. So we're going to round that up and begin our analysis in 1850. And by 1920, all but four states had granted women property rights. So everybody except for Florida, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Arizona. Now we're going to end our, our analysis in 1920, not only because by then all, all but four states had granted women rights, but also this is when the 19th Amendment was passed. The 19th Amendment, of course, giving women the right to vote. So after women have the right to vote, it's not so clear how these, these things would be enforced by a legislature. So you can also think the moral equivalent in our... Uh, more modern times is that um, unilateral divorce rights were given state by state starting around 1960. And by 2011, every state except for New York had given women the right to unilaterally divorce their husband. But in New York, in New York it wasn't necessarily well enforced. So we're going to stop in 1920 because we don't know what enforcement looks like afterwards. All right, so the first analysis that I'm going to do is try to convince you that after property rights are granted, people really change their portfolios. So fortunately for us, in 1860 and 1870, the census asked about individual holdings of personal property and real property. So that's fortunate for us that they asked at this time. It's unfortunate for us that it was they only asked in these two, two years. Um, so what's, between 1860 and 1870, six states gave women property rights. Um, and these states, so some of them were small. So Colorado and Wyoming at this time had very few inhabitants, but some were quite large. So Ohio is known as the uh, homeland of American presidents since so many were born there. So these states actually represent about 20% of married households at the time. And what we're going to do is um, run a simple diff and diff. So states are granted rights. These are our, our treatment group. Compare them with everybody else. Now, the immediate criticism of this exercise is that um, we can't control for pre-existing trends. Right? We only have two years. You can't look at trends before the treatment. I'll tell you how we get around that We're going to, or try to get around that by doing a border analysis. I'm going to push that off for a few slides. Um, one no aspect to note is that slaves everywhere except for in Louisiana were considered movable property. In Louisiana, they were considered real property. So that's actually why if you um, look at the economic historians who study slaves, they almost always look at Louisiana because you, actually, you have the actual deeds, so the transfer of slaves. Um, in that time period in New Orleans. Um, so, okay, so we're going to drop slaves because gra granting them freedom during the Civil War was a big portfolio shock that we don't want to, to model. So we're doing a basic diff and diff. Here post is 1870, so the after. Switch S are the states of granted rights. And then we're going to control for a bunch of stuff. So we're going to control for county level fixed effects. We're going to control for relative TFP rates between manufacturing and non-agricultural employment. So you might think that what's going on is that um, TFP, so technology related to manufacturing, is growing. So people shift their portfolios in response to that. So we're going to control for that. We're going to control for urbanization rates, um, the political environment. So that's a fraction of the votes that went to the uh, Democrat in the, most re pre in the previous gubernatorial election the fraction of the population that's female, and interact this with 1870 dummy. So the hope is that these state-level controls sort of help capture trends. Um, and then we're also going to have individual controls, including age and whether or not you live on a farm. And when we do um, a border analysis, we're going to look at your distance a household lives from a state border and interact that distance with posts. So we're going to have geographic trends that change over time. So you think of this as a difference in discontinuities approach. I'll be a bit clearer on that in a minute. So if before looking at the border, just drop this last bullet for a second. These are the regressions that we run. Uh, the first panel, the first column is a simple diff and diff. Second column, we add our state level controls, then our individual controls, 
And then we do the most unkosher thing in the world. We add total assets to the right-hand side when we're looking at portfolios on the left-hand side. The reason we do that is just you might think, hey, um, people might respond differently at different parts of the wealth distribution, so we want to take a look at that. And the last is we drop states that um, followed different uh, legal pro uh, practices um, based on civil law. So the top panel, panel A, is where the dependent variable is a fraction of household wealth that is invested in movable assets. So it's about 40% on average. And what you see is that this changed by about one to two percentage points. The second panel B is the extensive margin of movable. So this is, do people have movable assets at all? You can think, do they have a bank account at all? And as soon as you grant women property rights, a lot more people start uh, opening up bank accounts. The panel C is, do people own any real estate? So as soon as you grant women property rights, a lot fewer people hold any real estate at all. So you, uh, people seem to really be responding to this incentive. So then the next thing that we do is we say, okay, let's forget about Colorado and Wyoming. They were pretty small states. New Hampshire, Ohio, Indiana, and Minnesota were the states that granted women property rights between 1860 and 1870. And let's focus on these borders. These borders are pretty arbitrary. So look at if you ever drove on Route 80 going out west, the border between Pennsylvania and Ohio, if you don't know it's there, you don't know it's there. So let's just take a look at how portfolios change as you approach this border before and after Ohio gives rights as compared to Pennsylvania and run the exact same regressions. So what you get is, if anything, things are a bit stronger. Um, so with the exception of this top left corner everything is and this one over here, everything is statistically significant and stronger than what I showed you two slides ago. So this, this comparing these state borders gives us confidence that, hey, it's not really pre-existing trends explaining what's going on because people in Pennsylvania and Ohio on that border are pretty similar. Okay, um, going on to exercise. So I just showed you, hopefully you bought it, that um, once you give women property rights, people respond by changing their portfolios. They put more money in banks. They may not have any real estate at all. Now let's talk about how this affected things on the aggregate. So I want to tell you two things first. One is that it's pretty well known that interest rates in America at this time were widely dispersed. So there's a large literature saying that inter, um, regional interest rates um, varied so greatly due to things like uh, risk premium varying across the country and also legislation forbidding interstate branching so of banks. So I have a bank in New York. I can't open up a branch of my bank in Massachusetts. So it's hard to move capital from one state to another. So what this is, is a, it's a paper from 1898, where what Breckenridge did was he looked at what he called double name first class corporate paper in every city in America in a cross section of time. So double name first class corporate paper, if you Google that term, he's the only person who's ever used it in the history of the world. But what he's talking about is high class corporate debt with a very low default risk. So what he's arguing is that, look, these are corporations that don't default. I'm controlling for di differences in risk premia across the country. And what you see is large variations in interest rates between regions. So this, the lowest interest rate was below 4% in Boston, as opposed to Denver, Colorado, it's about 10%. So between regions, there are large variations in interest rates. But also, if you just think about the Amtrak Northeast Corridor in America between Boston and Philadelphia, pretty substantial variation in interest rates there as well. So this is one just snapshot in 1890, 91 to 94. The actual data I'm going to use looks more like this. So this comes from um, a series of uh, economic historians culminating in Bodenhorn, looked at bank loans and the profits of banks made from all their discounting activity divided by the stock of bank loans, how much they've given out in general, inferred from that an interest rate. And you can calculate that interest rate by state year over time. And here I'm just collapsing it for you by region over time. Now, the obvious criticism of this is that this incorporates both differences in interest rates, as you might normally think of them, but also differences in portfolios that the banks have. So I'm really hoping that the previous slide convinced you that there's actually differences in the regions and in interest rates, and it's not all just differences in risk premia. So the next thing that I want to do just as like a motivation is every dot here is a region is a state year interest rate. All I'm doing is netting out year fixed effects. So we're netting out the aggregate economic fluctuations at the time in America. And I'm plotting them 
relative to the year that that individual state gave women rights. So you can see a pretty significant drop in interest rates after women were given rights. So people start putting more money in banks, interest rates come down. The next thing that I'm going to do is just formalize this in a regression approach and try to show you that it's robust to a bunch of stuff. So now when my dependent variable, YST, is going to be either the interest rate in state S in year T, so this interest rate series goes back to 1878, or going back to 1865, we have data on deposits and loans in national banks. So those are banks that are um, regulated by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency as opposed to state-level banks, which is much harder to get the data on. And so we look at the um, deposits and loans in national banks going back to the right after the Civil War. We look at how these interest rates, deposits, and loans are affected by rights. Year, um, we control for year fixed effects or region year fixed effects, depending on the specification, and state fixed effects. Now, one thing that you might be worried about is that, hey, David, a lot of things are changing at the same time. It's not just women's rights. So um, I'm going to start, I'm going to work backwards on this one, state level controls. So first of all, usury laws we put on the right-hand side. What's a usury law? Usury law means that this is the maximum legal interest rate that the state allows people to lend at. So we control for that on the right-hand side. A big part of uh, one of the revisions on this paper was I had to expand this. Um, all the literature only goes up to 1891 because there was a paper published in 1891 documenting the history of usury laws by state year. If anybody wants the data going from 1891 to 1920, look in the online appendix. Nobody's touched that. There's a lot you can do with it. Um, whether or not a state has a banking authority at the time, whether the state had a required reserve ratio or not. So this is before the Federal Reserve. Um, and we all know about limited liability corporations. Not everybody remembers that at this time there were, depending on the state and year, exemptions for bank stockholders. So I own shares in a bank, the bank goes belly up, the creditors from the bank can come after me anyway. So we control for that on the right hand side. We control for whether or not the state was a territory at the time. And you might think, the last thing is a fraction of the neighboring states with rights. So you might think, okay, I'm, I'm Rhode Island. New York grants women rights. Maybe that affects my financial markets anyway, even though state uh, laws forbid interstate branching. So these are our financial controls, this XST. Um, so what we do we, um, is the first column here is looking at interest rates, just of regressing on state fixed effects and year fixed effects. Then the column two is we add all those financial controls like usury laws, limited li um, double liability for bank shareholders, et cetera. And then column three is we switch from year fixed effects to region year fixed effects. And what you see is that granting women property rights dropped interest rates by about a half a percentage point to 80 percentage point, 80 basis points, depending on the specification. So you can think the average interest rate at the time in America was about eight or nine percent. So this is about a 10 percent reduction, five to 10 percent reduction. Um, Repeat the same pattern and just look at deposits and loans, and you see deposits and loans are going up by a lot. So this really does look like a supply shock. So people, you change laws, people put more money in banks, you see that on the aggregate, it also affects interest rates. Um, okay, so now just take a look quickly at, at column three, and this, um, there, there's one star, this means it's statistically significant at the 10% level. I just want to show you one more way of calculating that. So what we do here, is we say, OK, let's randomly pick a date between 1850 and 1920 that Massachusetts gave women rights and do the same thing for every state. If you run this, our regression on random dates, you expect to find no effect of women's rights, which on average, 0 is what we find. We just do this 50,000 times, this random falsification test 50,000 times. This is the distribution that you get of estimates on fake women's rights. Over here is the estimate that you get on the actual dates. So what is the fraction of simulated random women's rights dates that you get a stronger effect? Well, it's less than 1%. So this is really telling you that there's something about these dates that women, gave, that women were granted property rights that really seem to affect interest rates. Now just do this ex exercise again on deposits and loans, and you see that the results are pretty robust. So now the next thing that I want to show you, just checking the time. I have until I have another fifteen minutes. No, we have discussion. Oh, minutes. ten minutes. Okay. So next thing I want to show you is just how did this affect the real economy? So 
grant women property rights, people change their portfolios, supply shock to the market for loanable funds. Here is, so we're only looking at male workers. Women didn't work that much. Um, what fraction of them are, are non-agricultural employment over time? So this is a measure of uh, uh, economic growth or industrialization. And in every year I show you the 90 and 10th percentile of states. So you can see the South is getting hit pretty hard by the Civil War. What I'm doing here is just looking um, at any given state, ST, as state S and your T, the fraction of their male employment in non-agricultural labor, so NA for non-agriculture, K years before or after that state granted rights. So I'm doing an event study approach. And I'm uh, going to control for a bunch of stuff. I'll show you on the next state, uh, slide. And then I'm also going to do a border analysis. So, um, so what, what's going on here? Column one is we're only controlling for state fixed effects and year fixed effects. Um, everything is relative to a decade before states granted women rights. So this is census data. We only have it once per decade. What you see is there's no clear trend before women were granted rights. After women are granted rights, a statistically significant and economically meaningful fraction of the labor force shifts from, from the farm to not being in the farm anymore, to being in industry. And what we do here is we just add controls one at a time. So in corporation, can you set up a limited liability corporation in that state without an act of the state government? Um, what's the fraction of the population that is female? Measures of human capital, measures of how young the, um, the labor force is, which might tell you how easily it can adjust and the, what, whether or not bordering states have granted rights. In all specifications, you see the same pattern that before rights are granted, there's no um, clear trend. After, there's a dynamic increase in women's rights. So I just want to show you what this last column looks like plotted. So I'm just taking these numbers and plotting them over here. There's no clear trend before women are granted rights. After women are granted rights, there's a dynamic and statistically significant increase in industrialization. So women's rights had an effect on the real economy. So now I just want to show you um, what, what do I mean by a border analysis over here. So this is a map of America in 1850. Only Massachusetts has granted women rights. This is continuing to grow. Um, so every square here is a county in America. You can see the outline of the states and just signaling which states had granted women rights by any date. So 1890, 1900, 1910, 1920. So what we're doing is we're just saying, OK, let's think about in 1870. Ohio just granted women rights. Pennsylvania had not. So let's take this part of Ohio on the border of Pennsylvania and call that its own state. Same thing with the part of Pennsylvania on the border of Ohio. Call that its own state. Calculate all of our variables again. So what fraction of the labor force in this part of Ohio is in the non-agricultural sector, and et cetera. And then just add a fixed effect um, such that this area of Ohio bordering Pennsylvania and the same area of Pennsylvania bordering Ohio share a fixed effect. So we're really just comparing across borders. Rerun all the regressions that I just showed you. You get the exact same thing when you're looking just across borders. So there's no, these are the exact same regressions as on the previous slide. There's no trend before women's rights are granted. After women's rights are granted, there's a dynamic reallocation of labor away from the farm and towards manufacturing, statistically significant and economically quite meaningful. So uh, up to about 9% of the labor force moves. That's pretty large. Um, I'm going to skip all the robustness exercises, but I'll just tell you quickly about them. Alternative definitions of non-agriculture. So you might think, well, women had rights over real estate. Maybe they owned a mom and pop shop on Main Street. So let's drop retail. Um, from non-agriculture and throw that in with agriculture. There was a fire that killed all the census data from 1890, so all that data is interpolated. What if we drop that? Um, what if we drop states that granted rights between 1870 and 1880? About a third of states granted in that time period. It's okay. And what if we drop states that granted after 1920 or states that operated on, on um, civil law? Nothing um, is that important. The, the point remains. So now the last exercise that I want to tell you about is about capital intensity. So if we take the 1870 census of manufacturers and go industry by industry and rank industries by their capital to labor ratio, um, um, and then call the top court, quartile of industries the top capital intensive, and the bottom quartile of industries by this measure the bottom capital intensive industries, 
So first of all, if you just look at the ratio of employment, it's about two. That means that twice as many workers on average work in capital intensive versus non-intensive industries. And if you look at the fraction of overall employment, it's about 3.5% work in the capital intensive and 2.9% work in the less capital intensive industries over time. And what I'm going to do is just run the exact same regressions I just showed you before and after women's property rights looking at these variables. So column one is taking a look at the ratio of employment in capital intensive to non-intensive industries over time before and after rights are granted. There's no trend before, dynamic increase after. The difference between column one and column two over here is column one doesn't control for anything, um, just your, fixed, your effects and state fixed effects. Um, column two includes all of our other controls that I showed you previously. Column three switches from a year fixed effect to region year fixed effect. Same story applies in all three columns. Now you can say, okay, we're looking at the ratio of employment between capital intensive and not capital intensive. That ratio is going up. What's the driving force? Is it that the capital intensive industries are growing or that the not capital intensive industries are shrinking? Well, actually what's going on is if you look at the log of capital intensive employment, that's dynamically increasing by a lot after women are granted property rights. And the log of capital not intensive manufacturing employment is also increasing, but by less. So when you grant women property rights and you deepen financial markets in America, what you see is that all industries are growing. Capital intensive and not capital intensive industries are growing. It's just that the capital intensive industries are growing by a lot more. So that's what explains this ratio increasing. Um, so just to sum up, the main point of this paper is that we're trying to say that the um, it, protecting investors and granting property rights is important for the development of financial rights and growth. Um, so we showed you that granting women property rights affects portfolios, financial markets, and labor allocations. Now, as a two-second pitch, if anybody is interested in hearing about the next paper um, that I'm working on on this, looking in England about why women were granted property rights, come find me for a beer later, and I'll tell you all about it. All right, so thank you very much again for inviting me. Thank you very much for the opportunity to say a couple of words about the paper. Um, the paper is published or accepted, right? Just accepted, yeah. So, you know, I'll try to ask questions which might be of more of a substance to the question rather than to the paper per se. Um, first of all, I think the this is a fantastic paper. This is how the economics should be. This is the economics type of paper because the property rights is fundamental and trying to understand how over the course of changing institutions, uh, we protect property rights or so we include more people in the economics activities um, and how that gives us better effects or economic growth. This is something we, we should actually study. Um, I have been working on blockchain over the last uh, year or two. And one of the hopes for blockchain, which might or might not realize, are actually about extending the property rights protection or recording through some kind of combination of uh, ability to record what people own and then an equilibrium around that where people agree on enforcing that. So in that sense, I think it's a very interesting exercise. I have a couple of questions which, which sort of bother me a little bit. Uh, they're not immediately related to, to the paper, but one is... The, so about your two uh, last two hypotheses, you 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 postulate that. Um, so I understand the first one. Okay, property rights change the composition of the assets that people will own. Because presumably, if I have a male child, if I have a, 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 a you know, if I have a son or five sons or something like that, then I don't really care about this I, because their property rights are not restricted when I invest in them, right? If I have a female, if I have a daughter, then I'm concerned about protecting her and therefore I invest into, into assets which are protected. So that's, that's the, the motivation and this is very clear logic. So there's a distortion. And if you remove that distortion or you remove that restriction on the ability to protect, uh, 
property rights of females, of your daughters, then of course you should expect that there would be a reallocation from that forced, uh, you know, real estate to, to something else. So that, that I buy. And at that point, I get interested in seeing how the allocations within families changed, uh, depending on the structure of, um, um, of children, of gender structure of children. So presumably in, in families with, with boys only, we should have seen fewer distortions. That should be consistent with the story. It's just uh, something I'm curious about it. And I wonder if there's more to it, um, which we initially don't think it's plausible, but if there's some, some distortion on the production of females versus males, or in the amount of investment I do in terms of raising them, giving them education, or giving them skills, because of these other distortions that there are in terms of assets. So if I have three, three sons and two, two daughters, you know, what do I do about, you know, who, who, who do I care for, you know, if I have uh, limited resources? So I wonder if there's something like that going on, and if those ch things changed after. So if property rights had some kind of unintended consequences, not only direct ones, but also in terms of welfare of children, because now you equal equalize uh, the opportunities for them. If you know, if I build a model in which I invest in children, and I want, then I'm, I'm investing in males, right? Because the, you know the complementarities between the assets I put in, which are unrestricted, if there are complementar complementarities between their wells and the investment of my effort in them bringing that they can later realize, right? So I wonder if it helps uh, women in some way or if it balances things out. So that's one question, the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis is clear to me. Um, it is the hypothesis in which if, you know, if we have now more demand in, the, in, in terms of families for bank deposits or for some assets, you know, the interest rate should go down or, you know, there should be more availability of the, of the, of the capital. So that's, this is great. Okay. So that, that hypothesis, I, I, uh, I understand. Then the third one was, um, if there is more capital, it somehow should go into the capital intensive industries. And this is where I'm struggling a little bit. So I understand you get the results, which is fantastic. But I'm a theorist, so I start thinking about you know, third order derivatives or something like that. So if I think of an equilibrium in which on margin the capital is equalized in such a way that the return on the unit of capital is the same in all industries, which is not the case necessarily, but you know, ex ante I don't have an, you know, any argument to make to, to suggest that you know, there are distortions of certain type. Then if I get more capital, free, you know, the, the prices, the cost is lower. I'm going to invest in both industries. And that what happens is that it's the second derivative which matters, not the first. Not the intensity, but the curvature of that intensity. That if I start investing more, it must be there is some kind of economies of scale or, you know, increasing returns in the capital. So implicitly there is an assumption on technology. That uh, maybe you know the second derivative on return of the capital is 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 higher actually in ag agriculture or in, in some so in other words um, think of um, you know you add one unit of capital and gives you one dollar but as you, you add the second unit of capital it's not clear that the capital in te you know one industry should give you two dollars and the other one is one there's absolutely no reason you find that but you know. And then also on the fourth hypothesis, a similar question then arises, you, you implicitly assume in complementarities, right? Between not substitution, between the you know, cheaper cap, right? So, so capital is cheaper, and so it, it means that the complementarities have to be higher in the capital intensive industries for, the, for that story to make sense. So these are two, two things which I was wondering about because, you know, in terms of justification or verification, so there must be some story about the second order uh, effects. Uh, at least I, I wasn't immediately, um, you know, put to ease when those uh, two last hypotheses were postulated. And, um, yeah, but that's no problem because the paper is accepted. So, so, so then, so I think then the interesting question is really what it does to the, uh, investment into children in some fundamental sense. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Oh, uh, thank you very much, Timothy. So uh, let me let me answer his his points, and then I'll take questions on the paper. So I I, I think first of all you were you were spot on, uh, especially let me start talking about sons versus daughters. So I have two things to say about this sons versus daughters thing. The first is that uh, we we wanted to do something about that on this paper. So the the way we wanted to do something was take a look at our household portfolio data from the census and divide households based off of whether they had sons and daughters or how many of each. The problem with doing that is that you find yourself with a very limited sample very quickly because people who are like 25 don't have their kids yet and people who are 40, well, their kids have already grown up and left the house. So it's really hard to do this on American census data. The second thing I have to say about this though is that uh, you jump into the, the next paper. So. Uh, the one where I said we, we should have a beer, but let me give you a quick preview about that because it's, it's right up your alley. So what we're doing there is we're looking at the votes in um, the divisions or votes in the British House of Commons around 1868 to 1870 to give women property rights. And we're look, linking how every member of parliament voted to both uh, demographic aspects of his constituency. So income per capita, uh, fertility rates, um, literacy rates, religiosity, things like that. But the hard thing that we're doing there is we're also linking it to his personal biographical data about how many sons and daughters he had. So there's this whole literature um, started by Ebony Washington in America looking at, at how um, congressmen with daughters tend to vote more in favor of women's uh, general feminist issues such as maternity leave and stuff like this. So we're, we're really doing the same thing on the British House of Commons in the 19th century, which will hopefully let us get exactly to that point. So this is really where we're going. Um, as regarding your second point about um, the industrialization, um, about, sorry, not, about the capital skill complementarity by uh, capital intensity, I have a model in the back of my mind. Thankfully, as you pointed out, I only had to keep it in the back of my mind during the process of publishing this paper, but uh, I'd be very happy to sit down and, and show you the equations that I have in mind, and you can tell me if I've lost my mind or not. But it, it's something that, it, that definitely did bother us while we were writing this, and I'd love to run by my argument with you offline. So thank you again very much, and I'll, I'll open up to other questions. Is there any now? Uh, yes. Well, again, as a data architect, <laughs> I couldn't help noticing that the data goes back 100 years, right? Did you have any attempt to uh, a little bit extrapolate to the current, you know, uh, population uh, like data and the dynamics in the current United States, with the women having not only property rights but prenuptial agreements rights and trust and inheritance. And I think uh, if you could probably extrapolate to the inheritance laws that you know currently affect United States and the uh, you know the debate in Congress and everything and how that could affect the current population and how could affect the, sorry, the current women rights uh, if your data of 100 years old and the model applicable to the current United States uh, law environment and women's property rights? So I, I guess we sort of think that there, there are two ways that this might be applicable to today. So one is sort of a direct way, which I think is what you were getting at. And by the direct way, I mean you give women property rights in 1850 or 1846 in Massachusetts versus you know, 1920 and a bunch of other states. Well, if you have an extra 70 years of women having property rights in one state as opposed to another, then that's an extra 70 years of women like being in part of the capital markets, being accepted by men as being somebody that they have to deal with, teaching their daughters that they need to learn how to invest and how to deal with a bank account. So these are things that we haven't looked at yet that we definitely want to look at. The other thing is what I would call more indirect effect. So the indirect effect in my mind, what this means is, um, you know, the question I always got from my mom on this was, you know, my mom is a big time feminist and always raised me that way. But she said at the end of the day, David, why do I care about this paper? This is 150 years ago. And my point to that was, look, um, women or my minorities in a lot of the world don't have full rights, economic or other. And so what, let's show the, the people and you know, these countries where women don't have full rights, the benefit of giving them. So learn from America's experience. So that's sort of the indirect um, answer. That makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, one small question. In, um, in the beginning of 20th century, Alfred Nobel uh, bought uh, silver mines 
in North Caucasus. And he, uh, no, he uh, bought at a very low price. And it was a problem how to force uh, uh, men of uh, North Caucasus to work in mines. Because they have cattle, they have shelter, and they don't need. And he opened a uh, no, chain uh, of shops uh, which sold uh, jewelry. And women told to their men to work. And uh, they forced their men to work to buy uh, jewelry. So uh, now our uh, market uh, is oriented for women demand. And in many families, 90% of uh, investment make women. I don't speak about business of uh, upper classes, but in middle classes and lower. It's the right. And the same situation was in, uh, 100 years ago. And how do you think? Is, uh, do, can you agree with the opinion that all this woman movement is a business trick to take women to the labor market? No, was it simply a business trick to, make them, uh, to take them into a woman market? And our society don't need women liberations. Okay, so they don't make us happier, women and men, I think. Yes. And what's, what's your opinion, Ron? Um, so, yeah, let me, let me start with this, the second question. Um, so do I think that this is, it, there's, um, I'm blanking on his name, there was a PhD student about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, I cite him in the paper, who was looking at the question, look, a big thing that happened here was giving women the right to their own labor income. Um, so you could think that maybe that should affect women's labor supply. Now, why doesn't it, right? So empirically, it doesn't. And the answer that he is proposing is that it's sort of a, a composition of two things. On one hand, um, like what we would typically call the substitution effect, you raise their wages, maybe they want to work more. On the other hand, this is a really big wealth shock going on. You're giving women a lot more money, which makes them maybe want to stay at home more. Right? So you can also think the so Svika was talking uh, implicitly about the changes in divorce laws in America. When I look at these divorce laws, what were these divorce laws? It was saying, once upon a time, to, to get divorced, you need both the husband and the wife to agree. Then you're saying, no, either party, especially the woman, can just demand I'm getting divorced now. Not only that, but depending on the, the, the split up of assets as the, um, defined by the state, because that was variable by state, women could suddenly demand a divorce from their husband and take half the assets. That was the biggest transfer in wealth in American history. That's the way I look at those divorce laws. So now the first question you were asking was more getting into like this household bargaining stuff, like do our women forcing their husbands to work harder to buy them certain jewelry? Um, that's, uh, so f for that, you have to definitely take a different model than Svika had. Svika had like uh, people having one uh, utility function. I don't have too much to say about that. What I can tell you is um, if you read some of the other papers that we cite there, people are looking exactly how granting women property rights affected household bargaining. And we come to a I haven't seen anybody say what you said, but they would come to somewhat similar conclusions saying, look, this increased women's bargaining power in the household. That led to more investment in human capital of the kids because we typically think that mothers care more about that than the fathers, um, similar to what Svika said. Um, okay. 